I only have a few scripture verses to share tonight. And uh, it wasn't too long ago that I just heard in my spirit, uh, the crooked places made straight. And, you know, in the past, I would just kind of trivialize that and just tuck it away. But I kept hearing the crooked places made straight. So I'm like, okay, I have to I have to dig into that a little bit, and that's what tonight's message is about, okay? The crooked places uh, made straight. So uh, why don't we stand up tonight, and we'll just ask for God's blessing on the word. Father, we are just so thankful for your goodness. We are thankful for Holy Spirit, which makes the word come alive and Lord, we are dependent on you and your anointing. Father, even if it's just one word that comes from your throne, it is enough, Lord, because you give us more than crumbs. You gave us the whole loaf. You gave us your son. So we know, Lord, that you will give us more than enough because you are the God of more than enough. And we just give you praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Okay, you may all be seated, and uh, the scripture that I had before me was in Luke chapter 3, verse uh, 4 through 6, and uh, this is one of the places that this uh, scripture comes from when it talks about the crooked places being made straight, and it says in Luke 3, as it is written in the book of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in and every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all people will see God's salvation. You know, when I think about the crooked roads being made straight or the crooked paths being made straight, this is not just for the unbeliever. This is also for the believer tonight the Lord was showing me because there are places also in the believer's heart that at some point perhaps were straight and at some point in time for whatever reason have been made crooked and we're going to touch on that a little bit more. But this picture that, the, that Luke talks about, which also came from the prophet Isaiah, if you look at what he says here, he talks about the straight paths, he talks about valleys being filled in, and he talks about mountains, mountains and hills being made low. Where does, where does that picture come from? Is that just some imagery? This is a real picture that he is presenting, which was done for the kings and the emperors and their armies. The road had to be made as straight as possible for the king. And if there was a valley, it says those valleys had to be filled in to keep that road straight and level. And if they were headed towards a mountain, they had to cut a roadway through that mountain to make that roadway as straight as possible. Could you imagine, without the benefit of the caterpillar, caterpillar earth-moving equipment, I mean, this was manual labor that took years and years to do. If you think of the Roman Empire, those highways it speaks of stretched for thousands of miles. If you could just think about the work that went into that. And they would travel long distances throughout the kingdom to minimize the ups and downs and the curves. And the roads had to be free of stones and of bumps. And as I was thinking of this picture, I was uh, reflecting back from my teenage years. Being in Italy many times in the summer, I would be in a car with you know, relatives or friends or what have you in these back highways that had twists and turns and they were going so fast. And I'm telling you, you were getting an ab workout and after an hour, you felt like you had a six pack, okay? 
And it was not good if you had motion sickness. Thank God I didn't suffer from motion sickness, but one of my sisters did, and she never did very well driving through those roadways. But just think about that for a moment. And, you know, they did all of this roadway preparation for preparing for the entrance of the king. That's what that was really all about. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, it says that a, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. A highway. This was a way that was high. It was built, elevated above the, the normal uh, street, above the normal pavement. And this was done by masterful engineers the Romans were amazing at this. That, like I said, it would reach to the ends of the empire. But they built these roadways in such a way to minimize any pooling of water or any collection of mud on the roads. So that when the king and his armies were walking on these roadways that were made straight, it kept their feet free of mud. I want you to see the imagery here, that they were walking on a highway of holiness, the word of God says, that kept their feet free of mud because of the way the road was built elevated and would allow the water to drain off the roads so they were not having to wade through water and through mud. The word of God speaks about Crooked, I want you to see what this word crooked actually means, because I did a little homework. I had to do homework for you guys, okay? <laughs> the word crooked means parched and lean and warped. Think about a, I was, the picture that came to my mind was like a plank of wood that's, that's just been parched and is dry and you see it warping. Okay, and just started to think about this, this highway and about um, the roadway it talks about here and, and streams in the desert. And I just started to ask myself this question, like, who makes a highway in the desert? Who makes a highway that goes nowhere? Well, I, I did hear some reports about some politicians who pass bills about roadways that went nowhere, but let's forget about that for a minute, okay? <laughs> a bridge to nowhere, right, Pastor Peter? Exactly. But who makes a highway? It talks about a highway in the desert. Who, who would build a highway where there is no life? Who builds a highway in a place that is forgotten? Who builds a highway in a place that is lost, in a place that is dead? in a place that is without life. Who would dare build a highway in such a place like this? But the word of God says, and it declares even to us, that eternity had an appointment with you and with me. And Jesus said, and, and this is the verse that he showed me, it said that Jesus said, I must go through Samaria. You know in the scriptures, the word of God says, uh, and, and I read in some places, it says that the Jewish people would prefer to walk a three days journey to go around Samaria than actually cut through the territory of Samaria. But why did Jesus go through this place that seemed forbidden to the Jewish people? Because the father said, I have need of a woman in Samaria. And Jesus was being sent to a woman to a place where the Father said, I have need of her. And the Father was saying to you and to me this night, even in this message, that I have need of you. I, he has need of you and of me this evening. Not because he can't do it without us, but because he desires to partner with us. And in Isaiah 35, verse 6, it says, then will the lame leap like a deer, and the mute tongue 
shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Again, streams in the desert. That seems like an unusual thing. It seems like a miraculous thing. How do streams break forth in the desert? You know, water is a sign. It's a sign of hope. It's a sign of life. That is why when NASA goes and they send, they, they have a, you know, a, 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 a rocket or shuttle or what have you that goes to another planet, what is the first thing that they look for? They look for water. Because if there's water, it's a sign and a hope that there could be life there. Water brings the hope of life. And you and I, we may ask, and I ask myself this question, streams in the desert? How can that be? How is it possible that a stream could just break forth in the desert? And I just say that it's okay to ask God questions. Sometimes we feel hesitant or we like, oh, I, I don't know if that's okay to ask God that question. It's okay because when the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and said, you'll give birth to a son and you will call his name Jesus, what did she say? How can these things be? She asked the angel a question. And the angel said to her, the spirit of God will come upon you with the power of the, of the most high will overshadow you. And he will be called the son of God. And you and I, we may ask, how can these things be? How, how is it that you or I can be born again? How is it that we are made new? How is it? that there will be streams of water, rivers of living water, bursting forth from inside you and me. The word of God said, because the power of the Most High will overshadow you. It says that he will come upon you, and what is born inside of you will be the Son of God. When you and I receive him, the Son of God is born inside you and inside me. In John 7, verse 37, the word of God says that on the last and the greatest day of the festival, it says, Jesus stood and he said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. For whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And he was speaking of the spirit that those who believed in him would later receive. You see, he says that rivers of living water will burst forth from you and from me. For those who believe in Christ, this is the promise of the Father. When he talks about crooked places that are being made straight, we may ask, uh, even like, um, and if, see if you can guess who I'm talking about here, because sometimes in, a, in our own thought process, our thought process sometimes could be made crooked. And we may say, who am I? Lord, who am I that you should? My family is the least, and I am the least in the family. Gideon, right? And he says, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about? Our thought process sometimes can be made crooked. And the picture that the Lord was showing me was a picture of a hose. And the hose, if you've, I'm sure we've all had this experience. The, 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 the valve is turned on full blast. And then there's a crooked place in the hose. The hose is pinched. And you have all the pressure, all that city pressure in that hose, but nothing is coming out because of a crooked place, a pinched place in the hose. And if you were to let that hose fall into a, a muddy pond, what would happen is that muddy water would get into the inside of that hose. Even though all that pressure is on. But what happens when that crooked place in that hose is made straight. That pressure of the water 
will blow everything out, and that hose does not have to be concerned about, can that muddy water come to the inside of that hose? It can't because the pressure and the flow of that water overpowers the muddy water from being able to enter into the inside of that hose. And in 2 Chronicles 20.20, it said that Jehoshaphat stood and said, listen to me. Judah and people of Jerusalem, have faith in the Lord your God and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets and you will be successful. You see, in this scripture that we read, John 3, God sent his, his, he sent his prophet John declaring the word of the Lord so that it would prepare the hearts of the people to receive the king of kings. He was talking about to making the crooked places straight, the war places in my heart and even in my thinking to make them straight. And I asked this question as I was reflecting on this. Is the word of God relevant in today's culture? Is the body of Christ relevant in today's culture? Amen. Thank you. <laughs> well, you tell me when the power of God falls, okay, and the addiction loses its grip. When cancer leaves someone's body, when deaf ears open, when blind eyes are opened, when demon possessed are set free, you tell me if the word of God is relevant. You tell me if Christ is relevant. You tell me if the church is relevant. We need to show the world a powerful church. In Matthew 9, verse 20, it says that a woman suffering from a flow of blood for 12 years spent all she had on doctors, but only got worse. And she came up behind Jesus and touched the edge of his cloak. And she kept saying to herself, if I only touch his cloak, I shall be healed. Can you imagine for a moment the prison and the crooked places in this woman's mind, in her heart, and also in her body, emotionally? Think about that. Twelve years. But the word of God said here, and this is what is so impressive, that she kept saying to herself. She didn't say it once. She repeated it over and over. If I just touch the cloak of his garment. And as she got closer and closer, she kept saying, if I touch the cloak of his garment, I will be made whole. You see, that crooked place in her mind was starting to be made straight. And as the crooked place in her mind was being made straight, she was positioning herself to receive a healing that would make the crooked place in her body made straight. And what I saw here, going back to the example of the hose that the Lord made me see, that sometimes that bent hose has been in that position for such a long time that you straighten out the hose you get help and you let go. And what happens? It bends back. Because it has been set in that position for so long. You come along, you try and help it straighten out, and it bends back again. And sometimes in order to prevent that or to release that bent, you need to bend it in the reverse direction. And the word of God was showing me that sometimes... You have to come in the opposite spirit of what the enemy is saying. The enemy will say to you, you'll never get well. But you come in the opposite spirit with the word of God and say, well, God's word says he is the God who heals all my diseases. The enemy tells you I'm unlovable. But you come in the opposite spirit and said, God says nothing can separate us from the love of God. The enemy comes and says, you are broken, you are damaged, but God's word says, by his wounds I am healed. The enemy says, 
I am too weak or you are too weak. But God's word says, God's, God arms me with strength. I am a sinner. But God's word says, your sins have been forgiven through Christ. I am abandoned. But God's word says, God decided in advance to adopt me into his family. I am rejected. But God's word says, I have redeemed you. You are mine. The enemy says, you are hopeless. But God says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, to give you a future. We come in the opposite spirit to break that bend that was in our thought process. In Luke chapter 8, verse 45, in that same uh, section where the woman with the issue of blood, after the woman touched him, the word of God says, and Jesus said, who is it who touched me? And when they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you on every side. Isn't that interesting? Everybody was pressing and touching Jesus. And when Jesus said, who touched me? Everybody said, that wasn't me. I didn't touch you. Isn't it interesting that when we are in a crowd around Jesus, it's so easy to be in the crowd. But Jesus didn't call you and me to be part of the crowd. He called you and me to stand out. He called you and me to be a, 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 like a, a lamp that is set on fire. He says, I've called you and I have appointed you. I want to just share one other thing about this woman and about the impact that she had on the community and perhaps on the nation when she was made straight. Because I believe her faith became a catalyst for the faith of many others. Because the word of God says in the following chapter, in Mark 5, it talks about this woman. In Mark 6, verse 56, the word of God says, whenever Jesus came into villages and cities, they would lay the sick in the marketplaces and beg him that they may touch even the fringes of his cloak. And as many as touched him were restored to health. Where did they hear this from? Where did they hear just touch the, the, the fringe of his cloak and they were made whole? Well, they heard it in the chapter before when the woman was confronted by Jesus and the crowds heard what she confessed, that I said in my heart that if I only touched the hem, the cloak of your garment, I would be made whole. And that word spread out and they all heard, all we need to do is even just touch the hem and it would be enough for us to receive healing. You see, when she was made straight, there was a river that was released from her. The Word of God says in the book of Revelations that there is a river that was released and that river would go to the nations and the leaves would be for the healing of the nations. This woman's faith, when she was, made, set, she was set free and she was made straight, her faith and her wholeness and the river coming out of her life was now healing the nation. The Lord is calling a river to come forth from you. And this night, if there is a place in your heart and in your mind that is bent for whatever it is that the enemy has been convicting you of and taunting you of, it is not of the enemy. And we come in the opposite spirit by the word of God. And we reverse that. We declare reversal against that. And we say that you are the temple where the Holy Spirit dwells, and that you are a river. The Word of God says rivers, not even a river, because he's a generous God, and he says rivers will come from you. So this night, we just want to say, Lord, if there is any bent place in my thinking or any bent place in my heart or even in my body, we come before you and we declare that, Lord, you are the God who makes us whole. You are the God who heals all our diseases. We come to a good, good father this night. It is not his will and it was not his will that this woman would stay in this condition.
So let's stand up this night and just give God praise and thanks for his word this night. Because he's making the crooked places straight. He has made, is making, and will make the crooked places straight. Thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. I mean, if anybody tonight, they, they just feel in their heart that they have been wrestling with self-guilt. They have been wrestling with a wrong picture of themselves than the picture that the Father has of you or whatever else it might be that you're struggling with. And you feel like there's a crooked place in your, in your heart and in your spirit. I mean, I, I feel like we, we, all, we all could gather in and, and say, yeah, Lord. Maybe we feel justified. We feel like, well, I was wronged. I'm justified to feel this way. And all we do is we put ourselves in a prison. God says he wants you to be free. So that when you're free, that river can flow freely through your life and will be a healing to the nations.